Hello and welcome to Unstress. I'm Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Now, if you're not familiar with the acronym SIRS, and I didn't misspell it, it is C-I-R-S, and it stands for Chronic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. Now, as many of you will know, the common denominator in all chronic diseases is chronic inflammation. There's a difference between acute and chronic inflammation. When we injure ourselves or there's some tissue damage, acute inflammation is an important part of the repair process. But when it persists for months or even years, well, that is the beginning of chronic disease. Chronic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, SIRS, occurs due to the inability to remove certain biotoxins such as mold from the body. It's said to occur in genetically susceptible individuals and can cause chronic fatigue, weakness, aches and vertigo and as you will hear, much, much more. Now, we've, all, we've also talked about putting your own house in order. We did that a few episodes ago with Nicole Bilgema. She gave us a great overview of the challenges of finding mold, first of all, and then actually dealing with it. Mold is a very tricky one. Well, my guest today is Amy Skilton. Amy is a naturopath and a herbalist, a nutritionist, a life coach, and an educator, and a very good one at that. I've heard Amy speak at many conferences, and she is an absolute wealth of knowledge. I heard her relate her own personal story with SIRS and mold at a conference on building biology last year in 2018. And I really wanted to get her on the podcast and share that story with you. Not only her own personal experience, but as a health professional, how she navigated through it. I hope you enjoyed this conversation I had with Amy Skilton. Welcome to the show, Amy. Thank you, Ron. So pleased to be here. Amy, uh, there's so much I wanted to talk to you today about, but I thought I wondered if we might just first start, give us a little bit of background about your own journey. Yes, sure. So I am a natural health practitioner, so a naturopath, nutritionist and herbalist, and that's been my, my whole career, actually. I got into it very young, and I feel, yeah, very blessed, actually, for so many reasons that that's the case, um, and from a personal point of view, um, certainly to be so well informed and educated as to keep my health in good nick. Um, I am very, very grateful for that. Um, and in case um, you hear it come through in my accent, I'm actually a Kiwi. Okay. And <laughs> we've had a few Kiwis. Look, we we cross borders. You know, we don't hold anything <laughs> anything back here. But I, we have plenty of Kiwis. There's some. Yes, I know. There's so many of yeah, us here. Yeah. The weather is is definitely overall better here in Australia, which I'm pretty sure is why so many of us flock. Here and I've been here now like 14, 14 years now. Well, I mean, I must say, with your prime minister, I was almost tempted to emigrate, but um, oh, you know, and there's so many good things that go on in New Zealand as well environmentally, politically, you know, socially. Yeah, uh, you know, let's not anyway. This isn't about New Zealand, it's about you, Amy. <laughs> go on, go on. So, so since being here, um, I've made Sydney my home and yes, I have a, an online clinical practice as well as um, having the joy and privilege of flying around Australia presenting, you know, the latest medical research at conferences, which is actually how you and I met. It is indeed. And look, you, you know, you cover, I've heard you speak on several occasions and have always been so impressed and uh, I thought, you know, just must get you on to share some of that knowledge with our listener. And I wanted to ask you, first of all, because one of the things we wanted to cover today mm. was this condition called SIRS, which is oh. an acronym C-I-R-S. Yes. I wondered if you might tell us a bit about that, what it stands for. What is it? Yes, oh, I'd love to. Um, so it's SIRS is, is the acronym, um, spelled C-I-R-S, and it stands for Chronic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. And it's an umbrella term that is used to describe a multi-system, multi-symptomatic um, condition that people can develop. And under the umbrella of SIRS, there are actually several 
variants and included under that umbrella uh, is Lyme and the co-infections that can occur. Um, Same with breast implant associated illness. But the form of SIRS that I personally developed back in 2017 is of the mold illness variety. Mm. And essentially, regardless of which variant you have, there's some sort of trigger Um, an environmental or infectious trigger that ends up creating such extreme and broad inflammation in the body. It's like a full physiological breakdown um, to experience it as a patient. And I'm saying that not to sound alarmist, but, you know, 2015, I actually delivered a seminar on mental health, anxiety, depression, and touched very briefly on the role of SIRS and biotoxins found in the home and the office and water damaged buildings and the way that that would impact somebody's mood and also briefly covered off all the physical symptoms. And, you know, I stood up there on the stage, the various, you know, state capitals talking about it like I knew what it was. Mm-hmm. And, the you know, a couple of years later, I was um, in the midst of all of those symptoms, plus more that the textbooks don't actually have, you know, haven't fully elucidated. And it really sort of landed for me a couple of things. First of all, just how diabolical it is to experience. It's very different from reading about something and understanding it as a medical professional and and having an appreciation for it intellectually. Um, But also, as I entered, I guess, um, the medical system as a patient, also trying to document things appropriately and get all the right tests done and rule out anything else that could be causing my issues, um, I was met with... um, uninformed and unfortunately uninterested practitioners Mm. actually and it was very scary um, to be so unwell and to be on the receiving end of you know actually very disrespectful and disdainful treatment because it is almost too hard to believe that someone can be this sick with this many symptoms because typically in in, um, medical models the teaching is you can really only have one system affected and if it's more than one system, they're making it up. Yes. <laughs> and I was absolutely treated like I was making it up. Mm. I mean, I'm, this is sadly, I think, one of the frustrations that people experience when they have complex illnesses mm-hmm. in, our, in our society. I mean, it's, it's just uh, a fact um, that is so frustrating. It's very frustrating and it's very sad, actually, that um, we have a – I guess, a culture and a social conditioning to just disbelieve anything we don't have a direct experience of. And I have to say, I'm guilty of that too. In my early years of practice, I graduated very young. I started practice at 22 and I look back now and I think, oh my goodness, Mm -hmm, (laughs) mm -hmm. I was such a young human. Um, But as a woman who'd actually never experienced PMS and I, you know, I was taught about the four different kinds of PMS and their hormonal causes, but I too, took that, you know, Mm. ignorant and perhaps somewhat arrogant position of having never experienced it, I did have a question mark in my mind. Is this actually a real thing (laughs) or is this something women just kind of make up? Mm -hmm, I don't know. mm -hmm. And and it wasn't until, you know, having been on the oral contraceptive pill for a while and had some estrogen build up and I started getting PMS symptoms, I thought, oh, wow, okay, you cannot out Jedi mind trick hormones and this is very real and it was a really good lesson for me and you know now some 18 19 years later um, I don't question what my patients tell me that they're experiencing I think um, people who are hypochondriacs or making things up are extremely few and far between And if someone is in a position of making something up, there's also something wrong anyway that needs um, Mm. to be elucidated. But, you know, with all the patients I've seen, I have seen and heard some really extraordinary and bordering on unbelievable things. But the human experience is very real. And I think science actually 
we're conditioned to believe science has all the answers. It has a long way to go to explaining things, let me tell you. <laughs> mm. I, mean, I mean, I think it's so interesting when you do take a complex history with a, with a patient and you are a particular practitioner with a particular interest or specialty, mm. it's so easy just to hear what is relevant to you True. rather than to hear what is relevant to the patient. And I often th say that if I had a choice of what I could go back and study, I wouldn't do a PhD in any particular thing. I'd go back and study anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry mm -hmm. and understand how all these systems interact. And as a yes. patient is explaining to me these ridiculously, seemingly unrelated um, symptoms, actually mm. with the knowledge of biochemistry, anatomy, and physiology, mm. they make sense. Yes, yes. Mm. And I wonder if that's because so much of um, allopathic training models of, are about treatment as opposed mm. to looking for the cause. Yeah. And I think um, you're right on the money there when you're looking at the biochemical pathways of the body and the way the body actually functions and physiological responses. It is a very powerful and, of course, a much more holistic way of looking at someone. And you can actually then follow the breadcrumbs as to where their problem is being triggered from or what might be contributing to it and actually dealing with that as opposed to treating the symptoms. Mm. But what a great experience to be a patient. I mean, obviously, we'd rather avoid it if we could. But, but <laughs> As a health practitioner, being a patient is a very humbling experience. And um, yeah. so you went out there and you did some field research about SIRS. You wanted to get some personal experience in it. Well, you may not have wanted to, but you did. <laughs> tell, us, <laughs> tell us what happened. So what happened was I actually um, was taking a year off so that I could um, write a book, create a skincare range, create an online program. And really, you know, life is very busy and I needed to create some space in my life to actually work on these projects that, you know, I was really struggling to chip away at um, with everything else I had on my plate. And so um, also opted for a bit of a sea change at the time and moved to a beautiful apartment in Manly Beach. So it's on the northern beaches of Sydney for anyone not from here, um, within walking distance down to the Fairy Bower. So it was just gorgeous. We mm. had um, a lovely couple of months over summer and I was just really resting and, and recharging ahead of what I was going to tackle that year. And was pretty excited about everything. I'd mapped out the whole, uh, I actually had 15 months all up actually to myself, which is just such a, um incredible position to be hmm. in. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, what I didn't know was the apartment that we'd moved into had been recently renovated and something had gone wrong with the bathroom renovation. And what was happening every time the shower was being used was that water was actually... um filtering out from somewhere in the waterproof membranes. I'm not actually sure of the exact details. Um, at the time, I was too ill to pay all that much attention, but the water was actually seeping under the carpet throughout the entire apartment. So it's about as bad a leak as you can get without it being obvious, like a pipe obviously bursting and, and spraying water everywhere that you can see. And because I was living and working from home and it was a sunny, you know, well-ventilated apartment, the wet carpet actually wasn't apparent either. Mm. And so for months and months living in this property, I was flooding it and <laughs> didn't know. Mm. And even though the carpet was cream, the mold actually never appeared on the top. It was all growing underneath. So very slowly over you know a period of about three, four, five months, my health started just ever so surely declining and heading in the wrong direction. Mm. And un unfortunately, because the symptoms sort of came on um, slowly and, and almost independently of each other as inflammation was building in my body and my tissues were becoming more damaged, there really sort of wasn't a, an extreme initial experience that um, gave me a big clue that something was really horribly wrong. So I guess um, looking back, it started with weight gain and as a nutritionist and someone who's always been physically active, um, that was somewhat alarming, but I'm also rapidly approaching 40 <laughs> 
and thought, oh, this is the middle age spread they talk about. I'm going to have to you know, <laughs> work a bit harder to stay fit and healthy here. And, you know, and I'd had a few months of just a really relaxing summer. And so I just really wrote that off, even though my weight had been stable and healthy my whole life. I made, you know, I made an excuse for what was going on rather than thinking, oh, gosh, something's really wrong here. So it was 10 kilos. It sort of crept on mm. and. Um, and I hadn't really noticed it because it was summer and I was living in, you know, swimsuit and shorts and T-shirt and whatever. And then energy as well. So I was very tired. I was sleeping a lot. Um, I, became, I turned into what I now know is referred to as a spoonie, and that is someone with, you know, major fatigue and energetic issues where you don't have enough energy to even get through your basic daily tasks. Um, but, again, I didn't really notice it because I wasn't working um, I was having a few months off. I only had to muster enough energy to walk down to the beach and read a book and get myself home. Um, and so it was only when I started to try uh, to get back into a working routine and an exercise routine that I was like, gosh, I'm exhausted. And, you know, having had a very busy career up until that point, I made an excuse for that too and, and said, oh, you know, I'm just worn out, exhausted. And this all occurred over a period of Three months, six months, nine yeah. months. What? So it moved in uh, early November, and it was it was March, April that the penny dropped for me. So mm. it was, I guess, four months or so. It sort of crept up, but the I can tell you, February nineteenth was really the day everything did take a dramatic turn for the worst, and and that was because I had a um, a styling session with a girlfriend, and we we pulled all of my clothes out of the closet, shoes, bags. And as you what, do, as you as do. do, it was you know. It was yeah, a the girls day. get together. You know, I know what it's like. <laughs> it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but in the process, I disturbed all of the mold spores that had been gathering and flourishing in all of my possessions. And from that day forward, I had constant allergy problems, couldn't breathe, blocked nose, runny nose, itchy eyes. Started taking antihistamines, and um, and then from there, it really just escalated. And, it, and I was exhausted all the time but couldn't sleep. I was awake with anxiety for hours through the night. Um, I couldn't – my brain actually became so inflamed that I actually couldn't couldn't take any new information, and which was particularly distressing when I found out what was wrong with me and was trying to learn more about it. But, you know, I couldn't even read a book or um, focus properly. I was exhausted after exercise. I started having – night sweats, I was getting muscle cramps, my skin um, just totally changed to this dry, irritated, cracked um, state that just was so foreign to me. Um, my memory was terrible. I found I was um, starting to have, write my notes everywhere and trying to, and setting alarms on my phone to remind me to do stuff. Um, I was having temperature swings, weird appetite swings. Um, I was also getting up in the morning and feeling like I was 90 years old. So my joints were incredibly stiff and sore and it took me a while to kind of warm up. And, you know, that's just the, the tip of the iceberg with all mm, the symptoms mm. you get with SIRS. But it sort of really started accumulating. Um, but it actually took someone, a friend of mine on social media, posting about a leak and some mold issues in their house for the penny to drop and for me to realize we actually had a very serious problem. And and by an absolute stroke of luck and good fortune, when I'd first moved into that property, the strata had actually contacted us and said, there's a leak into someone's garage below and we think it's coming from your place. We want to send a plumber. And turns out it was coming from our place and we didn't realize it was affecting the apartment at the time, but I actually put two and two together and went, oh, my goodness, this is what's happening. Hmm. And so that's really where the journey began for me as a patient and as a practitioner and as someone who has now gone on to study building biology as yes. well. well. That's a big topic, isn't it? I mean, we're hearing so much about modern builds, you know, mod modern buildings and regulations and how – you know, so the whole how does the old and the new buildings stack up in this is is an interesting question, isn't it? It is. Well, it, it, there's no perfect answer unless you are building something from scratch yourself with that in mind. Um, but generally speaking, I have found older buildings to be much better. Mm. Um, and as long as, you know, the, any sort of 
old pipe leaks and corrosion are, are kept, you know, um, in mind, they do tend to fare a lot better because with newer builds, there's a few factors that are problematic. You've got construction moisture with the water that goes into making concrete. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, buildings are being put up uncured or not sufficiently cured, and there's still a lot of water still to evaporate out. Um, building envelopes, uh, the way that they're sealing in um, units these days, particularly if they're labelled energy efficient, that tends to mean possibly a mould trap because if moisture vapour can't get out of the home in terms of sweating, cooking, showering, um, and it's not vented to the outside efficiently in the kitchen and bathroom, within 6 to 12 months you're going to have a microbial load in the home that's very unhealthy and it's going to be quite difficult to get rid of and then in addition to that you know in the mid 80s or so they the Australian building code which there are a few things in there that leave a lot to be desired one of them is around waterproof membranes they shifted to um, acrylic membranes as opposed to sheet membranes and they have a lifespan of seven years um, tops and if anyone's using like a natural based cleansers they're actually accelerating the degradation of their waterproof membranes and so eventually the shower area is going to become a problem so this is now you know god i'm listening to this uh, amy and i'm already concerned because uh, because uh, when people build bathrooms and by people read me um okay. you know we, you you put the concrete down and then you paint it with this blue i guess acrylic membrane Yes. And that's that's got a, a life of seven years? Yes, I know. They don't <laughs> tell you this. Are you spending all this money to create oh, your dream bathroom? Yeah, and yeah. then so I mean if if in your position it would be wise to get a, a moisture meter to monitor, or if you haven't gone too far in, you could possibly apply Lots more coats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, well, it's way past that. But the other one is also, you know, the the old fashioned vents that used to be in the walls. Mm. You know, it's a very popular thing to do to make an energy efficient home to seal those off because you don't want to lose the warm air. Sure, mm. but that's a problem. It is a real problem, you mm. know, especially um, when you consider that the each person in that home is emitting the equivalent of 10 litres of water a day. Mm -hmm. So you've got moisture on your breath vapour, you've got moisture um, coming from sweating, and then you've got cooking and cleaning, um, showering, and then if you're drying clothes inside, which a lot of us have to resort to doing, especially in apartment buildings during winter, where does that water go? Mm -hmm. Into your walls and your couch and your mattress. And um, it is a real problem. And I think one thing that I would love all households to do is invest in a couple of thermohygrometers and a dehumidifier. And thermohygrometers you can pick up very cheaply, and they're just a little battery-operated um, sensor that measures the temperature and the relative humidity. And just, you know, to give you something practical to, to look at, you want to keep the humidity between 45 and 50 percent, which will uh, avoid providing enough moisture for um, fungi to grow, bacteria to grow, viruses to proliferate, and also dust mites um, to also enjoy mm -hmm. the moisture. And you can then, you know, utilize your dehumidifier to reduce the humidity as and when it gets too high. Now, of course, in Sydney, we're on sandstone, um, there's an aquifer underneath us, we have a, lot, a humid environment. Environment. So this is something that Sydney siders are probably going to have to be doing um, for a fair way of the year round. But especially if you're drying things inside or several of you have been through the shower, you can just maintain that environment. And if you are in a in a quite a watertight or sealed energy efficient home, this is going to be absolutely essential to protect your property and your possessions and your health, of course. Mm -hmm. And the humidifier is very portable, so you just can move it around if you have to. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. I certainly do that here, one in each room. You know? Yeah, Isn't it amazing, though, and again, going back to our experience as a health practitioner when you're dealing with complex issues, and I know you and I were both presenting at the Building Biology Conference last year, yeah. and um, I just came away from that and I thought, what – what, this, unless you put literally your own house in order, mm. um, what is the point? Because you could be on the best diet in the world, the best supplements in the world. You could meditate, yeah. exercise, da 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 da. Yeah. But you go home 
And you're, so, I mean, it's okay. It, it is about building resilience into your body sure. so you can cope with it. I get that. Oh. But for some people, um, and, and clearly in this instance for you, you had exceeded your physiological limit. That's right. And the thing is we spend around 90 to 95% of our time indoors. And it is really one of the single biggest influences on our health. And what's really upsetting is for anyone who's unwell, you spend more time inside because you don't feel well enough to be outside doing stuff. And if what's really, I think, an interesting unfolding in naturopathic medicine, and I hope across the board in medicine is, you know, as a naturopath, I have was trained to look for the cause of someone's problem and then the cause of the cause. But in terms of um, the built environment's influence, um, we were taught a lot about chemicals. We know that Wi-Fi isn't great, but it was very the very beginning of mobile phones when I was studying. And certainly um, the microbial or the microbiome of the home and problems with damp buildings was not something I was taught. And certainly as someone who treats patients, that was that's a really big blind spot mm. and it now has really opened my eyes to an element that most of us are not considering with um, near enough gravity um, or scrutinizing and I actually haven't shared this with you but I'm actually creating a program for medical practitioners uh, for next year to actually teach them about SIRS as well as the building biology elements of it, as well as how to diagnose it properly, how to mm. treat it. Um, because I really think there are many conditions out there today with diagnoses of chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, um, even things like um, mast cell activation syndrome, POTS. Um, there's a whole sort of catch-all to describe syndromes that are actually being triggered by the built environment mm. and they're being missed and these patients are being are falling through the cracks actually. Yeah. And are there blood, to, in terms of diagnosis for SIRS, um, are there any blood markers or things that that could give us a clue that something's going on? Yes, there are a lot actually, but unfortunately they're not things that a GP would commonly first think of to test. Hmm. So for example, you know, if a GP is looking for inflammation, they'll often do CRP or ESR or both, uh, but typically SIRS doesn't cause a rise in either of those inflammatory markers. And so a patient would, you know, likely be told, oh, there's no inflammation in your body when in fact there's hundreds of inflammatory markers and you're trying to, to judge an iceberg by the tip, essentially. Mm. And so um, there are a few things, there, and not all of them are blood, but if we talk about blood, um, there are key inflammatory markers that do go up. So C4A is one of them. It's part of the complement system, which is a family of inflammatory cytokines. And um, it's interesting. It, it seems to be quite specific to mold, whereas C3A seems to be quite specific to Lyme or other bacterial infections. And of course, um, there are people who have Lyme who also have SIRS mold illness as well, in which case you'll see both. Mm -hmm. um, another one is called transforming growth factor beta. And um, high levels of this, of course, um, cause serious neurological symptoms, neuropathy, numbness, tremors, um, and can create an asthma-like syndrome as well. Um, matrix metallopeptidase or metalloproteinase 9 is another cytokine that goes up. And this one actually degrades collagen. And so it is responsible for that accelerated aging that say you that, see. Say that one again. Um, the, the short version is MMP9, which stands for Matrix Metalloproteinase 9. Okay. Now it's a it's an enzyme that degrades collagenase, or sorry, collagen and gelatin, and um, really breaks down extracellular matrix. And this is really where you can end up with um, collagen loss, hypermobile joints, mm. um, accelerated aging, that sort of thing. Mm. And, of course, leptin. Now, leptin is sort of one side of the appetite seesaw uh, where ghrelin sits at the other end. And you can end up with high levels of leptin and leptin resistance, which is what contributes to the weight gain. Now, there are the odd 
mold illness patients who will actually lose weight and that's because of the impact on the microbiome and gut absorption that mold can have but more often than not it's unexplained weight gain in some cases it can be very rapid you know I've Mm. seen people gain 20 kilos in three weeks it's really alarming stuff yeah well Um, you mentioned that you'd put on 10 kilos in a relatively short time yes i did Mm, yeah and mm. it it ended up climbing up to 15 kilos Mm. um which is you know very uncomfortable um not to mention i destroyed a lot of (laughs) seams in my pants because i refused to buy bigger clothes still with there's a will there's a way uh, that's right that's right you know with enough Um, willpower you'll get into those (laughs) pants good on you Oh my goodness! Um, so <laughs> okay. yeah, it was it was interesting, and, and the fact is, my appetite, you know, was actually quite low because my liver was really damaged, my digestion mm, wasn't mm. good, and I was eating a lot less. Um, yeah. And yet, the weight just kept climbing up, which was, you know, which is pretty distressing uh, experience. So that's some of them. Also, yeah. um, MSH, VIP. ADH and VEGF are other biomarkers. Now, there's other bloods you'll do to kind of check um, antibody responses, the impact on hormones, but there are also a couple of other tests that can be done that are not bloods. Mm -hmm. Um, One is a particularly sensitive MRI called a neuroquant, which actually measures the brain changes that are triggered as a result of the inflammation. Now, yeah, it's pretty pretty Mm. awful stuff when you start digging into the detail but Mm. um, certain parts of the brain shrink including the gray matter which obviously um, is why executive functioning is compromised uh, memory recall word finding um, basic maths things like that but um, in so I guess in a survival response um, certain parts of the brain will also expand and 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 hypertrophy in order to try and cope so there's a specific pattern you see with mold illness there's a specific pattern with Lyme Um, but for anyone out there who is perhaps thinking oh my goodness do I have this Mm -hmm. sorry that's what happens when you listen to stuff like this and (laughs) well I think it's an important one to eliminate because this would be of interest to people who might be frustrated with the way their health is tracking Yes, and I looking for agree. answers. So I, I don't think we should shy away from it. No, no. What I'm saying is if you've got um, a, several of the symptoms that I've talked about already or you look up symptoms of SIRS and if there is um, a history of perhaps water damage, there's been a leak in your home, a flood, you know, an appliance leaked or maybe there was mold growing anywhere in your house on clothes or anywhere, you can actually take a test called a visual contrast sensitivity test or VCS for free or at very low cost online. And essentially it was developed by the Environmental Protection Agency and it was used in pilots uh, in the uh, Air Force to check for chemical exposure and to see whether that affected visual contrast. Now, this is different to visual acuity. So if you've had an eyesight test by your optometrist, what they test is visual acuity. It's something completely different. So the visual contrast sensitivity test is looking for how sensitive your eyes are able to distinguish between light and dark. And there's a series of tests that you do on the left and the right eye. And there's, again, a very specific pattern that will show up where there's um, a degradation of visual contrast in certain columns of the test that will highlight mold illness because the truth is as much as mold triggers inflammation in the body, mold also produces chemicals called biotoxins. So it's actually a, I guess, um, an environmental poisoning of sorts and that's what this test is actually picking up. So if you've been listening to some of the things I've been saying and and it's starting to look a bit like your health picture, you can easily do a VCS online and actually see whether there's an indication there to go forward and check the blood markers. Mm. I mean, isn't it interesting because as you say, um, it's easy to dismiss a patient and and these two blood markers that you mentioned, CRP, C-reactive protein and ESR, are two very common um, inflammatory markers. And if a doctor did that and your tests were low, they would say, no, you're fine. And yet there is so much more. Um, Yes. What, uh, I mean, the obvious about what can we do about it is to get out of that environment or to to address the mould. And that's not always so easy, is it? Oh, my goodness. That is, I don't want to 
you know, be a Debbie Downer, but it is much harder than, than you know, you think. Mm. And the reason is, is the prevalence of water damaged buildings in Australia, certainly in my experience, which is, you know, it's limited, but in my experience is, is really rife. It's mm. rife. So personally, um, looking for a rental property, I looked at 300 um, over a four and a half month period. Five, Hang on, 300 uh, different period. properties. 300 different oh properties. Oh, my God. Yes. So you really got yes. out there. Well, you must you yes. had to. You had to. <laughs> I had to. And had my to. survival depended mm. on it. Mm-hmm. And I can count on one hand how many were not obviously water damaged. Oh. And I think what's even scarier is 80% of the time it's not obvious. And, you know, I feel very fortunate to have finally found a property that, you know, I've been able to recover fully in. Um, but because of that, there are an awful number of people who've resorted to sleeping in cars or sleeping in tents, camping in, you know, their property's backyard if they yeah. own it or camping in the bush if they don't. Um, and it really is the impact on someone's life is absolutely horrific mm. and profound. Mm. Um, but there is actually, you really can't get well if you're in a water damaged environment. And so, you know, it, it really is when you come to accept how unwell you are and that you no longer want to be that way, you will just do what you have to do. Um, so, Amy, I'm just picturing you going into 300 of these properties. Did you walk in there with a thermo hygrometer? I walked in there with um, three items, mm-hmm. um, a flashlight, a moisture meter and a Swiffer cloth in order to do an ERMI test on dust samples if I thought the place looked okay. Hang on, hang on. Now, uh, okay, so a what cloth? Say that again, a Swiffer? A Swiffer, yes. Swiffer. S-W-I-F-F-E-R. It is a specific type of fabric that you can purchase as a part of an ERMI test, and ERMI is spelt E-R-M-I. And an ERMI test is one of many different tests you can run in a home to check whether there is an overgrowth of fungi or water-damaged specific molds. And you can do it via vacuum or a cloth, but, of course, a rental property. Rental properties here in Sydney are a hot property. Um, You know, there were queues of people looking at places. You can't come in with a vacuum and actually start doing mould assessment. The the agent's going to kick you out. Yeah, Um, yeah, I can just imagine that would be a great thing. Unusual, but 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 you walked in with a. You walked in with this cloth. I did, yeah. So that was in my back pocket. And so essentially the first thing you want to do is a visual inspection and bathrooms and kitchens are always sort of the hot spots. Um, and you want to look at the ceilings. Um, unfortunately, common practice, which I'm hoping to make illegal down the track, is landlords will simply just paint over mould, mm-hmm. um, which, uh, which of course is not a solution. You can't clean mould off porous items either you actually have to cut the ceiling out and replace it so you want to look at obviously the ceiling you want to look around the toilet basin you want to look at the floors the walls you also want to look at the walls that are um, on the other side the outside of the bathroom you know I walked into one property and it was a timber floor and you could actually see where it met the wall framing um, on the um, where the bathroom was on the other side, the darkest staining on the timber. So it had obviously been leaking, and he just repainted the walls, and I think perhaps it fixed the leak. But for someone with um, SIRS or the genetic susceptibility for SIRS, that's not good enough, hmm. um, and you will still get sick in that property even though the leak has been fixed. So, 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 but you've okay, you've you've done the visual inspection and obviously yes. you looked under the sinks and in the laundries yes. and bathrooms yes. and all that. But the Swiffer yes. cloth has got me intrigued. Okay, you, yeah, go on, tell me how you use the Swiffer cloth. So, this is what I would have done had I been called to use it. So, if a if a property had passed a visual inspection, both the outside, the lay of the land and the inside, and there was no obvious signs of water damage, what I would have done very subtly away from the property agent is use the cloth to take 10 different dust samples at least because dust is where the mold spores are going to accumulate. And essentially you get it um, analyzed using PCR analysis for DNA 
testing. And what you want to do is you want to take the dust samples from um, a few places. You don't want to pick up dirt uh, because that just makes it more difficult to assess the microbial load. But um, things like skirting boards and door frames, especially in the bathroom, so places that aren't cleaned that frequently, um, top of ceiling fans, um, but also just if, if it's furnished, you know, the bottommost uh, bookshelf shelf, and essentially what you're trying to do is capture enough um, samples so that a lab can analyze what's in there. And you can tell a lot from the analysis as to whether there's been any leaks by the species that are present mm. in the sample. Um, there are, of course, there's mold everywhere and you've got um, common indoor molds that are not problematic and aren't producing toxigenic um, compounds. So that's fine. If that's all you pick up, then you're like, okay, this looks like it's most likely to be tolerated and there are you know, a few other steps you could take after that if you're lucky. Um, but if you're picking up toxigenic molds or high amounts of um, molds that tend to thrive in high um, humidity, so aspergillus, penicillium, that's going to be a real problem. And if you're picking up things like Willemia or Stachybotrys, there's been a really serious water leak in that property at some point. And you would then have to ask, what they actually did to remediate and treat that. And the fact that you're picking up evidence of it says that they didn't remediate it properly and it would be unsafe. And so, you know, you can pay a building biologist to do these things, but, you know, 300 properties later, I'd be bankrupt. Mm. Um, and so I actually um, went and did the mold testing course at the Australian College of Environmental Studies myself, although I do provide training to patients and anyone who wants it to and a, and a checklist so that they know what to look for mm. um, when they go looking at properties. I've got one for renters and one for owners because it's, you know, it's actually just not practical to hire someone every time. Yeah. Um, but do, you, do you take the, the cloth for that particular um, place, you drop it into a little bag and send it off to a laboratory for testing? Yes, yes. So yeah. the actual ERMI test is quite expensive. It's about 370 380 but you can buy the cloths for five or six bucks. Mm -hmm. So you can basically take a bunch, go in there, take your samples, zip lock the bag up, and then decide whether you want to pay for it or not. And I'm saying that because for a lot of us that are very sensitive, some will actually react immediately when they go into a water dam damaged building. Now, for better or worse, I don't. Like in some ways, I wish that I did, uh, but my reactions tend, I tend to find out the next morning. And so if it had been me and I was really unwell the next day, I wouldn't bother spending that money because my body's already telling me that property is not mm. tolerable. Um, however, if I feel good and if whoever's doing it is hasn't got any of their traditional typical mold symptoms, um, I would and then say, okay, you can submit that and pay the money to, to actually check if that property mm. is safe for you. I'm just, um, you know, I can just imagine the real estate agent being very impressed with you going around with a dusting cloth cleaning up the apartment you're inspecting. <laughs> I can just... Anyway, listen, uh, okay, so SIRS is one of those really important things in this whole mould, uh, you know, water-damaged uh, issue. I noticed you also mentioned breast implants were there as well, and they always bother me. I mean, just the yeah. thought of it. Um, but anyway, but people have – how common is a reaction to breast implants? I don't think we know yet mm -hmm. because um, just like with mold illness, a lot of these symptoms can be written off as other things yeah. or, or kind of put in a different basket. And again, it's the breakdown of implants, the microbial biofilm that can be um, present in the capsule and the inflammation it generates in the body can really come on over a number of years. And for someone who's also paid a lot of money to, to put implants in who might really like the result that they got and it may even have been for you know, reconstruction purposes, it can also be very difficult to come to terms with mm. needing surgery mm. to get them out and become well. Um, but I am personally seeing thousands of Australian women who have been made very unwell because of their implants. And it's a bit like leaving a water-damaged building. Getting the implants out is the first step, but a mistake I am seeing uh, being made because, again, it's such an area that is uh, being denied by medicine um, at large is women are of the belief that 
getting them out is all you need to do to recover. And that's actually not the case. So you've got all the chemicals that went into the shell, the heavy metals, you've got microbial um, biofilms. So it's a bit like lime in a way, as well as chemical poisoning. And then you've got the inflammation from the immune system. So um, detoxification support is important. And of course, regu- like regulating all of the immune system and reducing inflammatory markers is a big part of it. But I think um, certain implants are a higher risk than others, and certainly with breast impa- uh, implant-associated ALCL textured uh, shells, are, that there's an undeniable link there now, although the information is not quite as widespread. But I think we're going to be seeing more and more of it, I'm seeing a lot of women getting them taken out, and I'm looking forward to the day where any woman who chooses it actually makes a properly informed choice because currently the position of, you know, the plastic surgeon associations is that they're perfectly safe and should last a lifetime. And that is absolutely not the case. Um, An interesting thing, a theory that I've sort of got in the back of my mind though, is yes, we have chemical problems there. Yes, we've got obviously heavy metal metals. We can see silicon migration without rupture which I think is um, news to a lot of people. Mm. Um, But in addition to that, anyone with mold-susceptible genes living in a water-damaged building is going to end up with a rise in MMP9, which, as I said, breaks down collagen and elastin and connective tissue. And I wonder if it's women living in a water-damaged building whose MMP9 is high that's causing their immune system to break the implants down. Wow. Uh, That's, well... Yeah, what an interesting and not entirely unlikely thought. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So I'm certainly interested in doing some more research in that area and and having a look for where risk factors are, you know, perhaps putting a woman at greater risk of of developing breast implant illness. But suffice to say, it's uh, an emerging area um, and there are a lot of women suffering at the moment. Hmm. Okay, look, oh, we covered some territory here. Look, I just wanted to finally ask you this, and taking a step back from your role as a naturopath, a nutritionist, herbalist, life coach, health coach, <laughs> um, you know, we're all on this health journey. What do you think the biggest challenge is for people on their health journey through life in our modern world, and it may well be our homes, but what, yes. uh, taking a step back from that, what do you think our biggest challenge is for people on our health journey? Look, I think um, one of the biggest challenges is actually coming up for air in your life to really look at are your habits serving you because ultimately it's our habits that will make and break who we are and that's obviously much broader from a health perspective but um, so many of us are so busy (laughs) making a, a living that we put off our health to tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and Monday, next Monday. And that day never comes. Um, and we're often that, that sort of final starting position is forced upon us when we have a health crisis. And I think the biggest challenge is people are not slowing down enough to listen to what their body is telling them quietly. And they end up being forced to listen when their body has a breakdown Um, So, you know, all of those other things aside, like environment, diet, mindfulness practices, getting enough sleep, of course, people are um, falling short in all of those areas a lot of the time. But it's, I think it really comes down to, you know, committing to yourself and practicing that level of self-love that allows you to regularly stop and take a, you know, an assessment. What is the state of the nation here? What do I need to change? And actually committing to doing the things that you know you need to do to support yourself to be the best version of you. Amy, what a great note to finish on. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll have links to your webpage and I look forward to those courses that you're developing for health practitioners. (laughs) Thanks, Ron. When it's hard to put an exact diagnosis on a condition, it becomes very frustrating. Needless to say, not just for the patient, but also for the health practitioner. Too often, difficult to diagnose conditions and frustratingly unwell patients are dismissed as, you know, all your blood tests look good, they look okay, you must be okay, rather than, uh, well, let's explore further. And it's not just with other tests, and as you heard. You know, there's some very specific blood uh, requests for blood chemistry that you need to be aware of. 
you also need to know what you're looking for, but also, and really importantly, looking in the home or the work environment for sources of biotoxins, moulds, other chemicals used in furnishing or building materials, electromagnetic, Wi-Fi radiation. It's easy to overlook this really important aspect of a person's personal health journey, but it can affect how they might respond to different treatments and ultimately recover from ill health. I think it's helpful to see health as a balance, particularly in our modern world. On the one side, you want to identify and minimize those things that have the potential to stress and compromise your immune system. It's why I focus on five stressors, emotional, environmental, nutritional, postural, and dental. Now, how much each of these stresses affects you as an individual is determined by your genetic predisposition. The other side of the scale is to build resilience by focusing on the five pillars of health, sleep, breathe, nourish, move, and think. Now, we'll have links to Amy's website. She has some great resources. So, until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner.